maybe my hook the hook will be a little bit more practical, which I don't know if that's very inspirational or not. Um, and uh, as the first lesson of working in any multinational company, I guess Willie would know the same. Even a very short presentation, you still need a PowerPoint. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to succeed. <laughs> this one, however, is not 53 slides, like the one this morning. <laughs> it's only five, and there's nothing, no more than three words per slide. Although, I guess I cheated by including a picture of words. <laughs> uh, so, cheating is allowed sometimes. Um, so, um, the, the first slide, uh, and I guess many of you will know if you're from ISEC, um, was really um, how you have to change yourself before you can change anybody else. Or you have to be inspired yourself before you can inspire others. Now, it, often it's an accident. For me, I joined ISEC because it said I could go study overseas or work overseas. No idea what I was getting myself into um, until I basically got brainwashed by these people with these crazy ideas, as you can see from uh, the mission of ISEC and other stuff. Shows how old it was, because back then, the long-term mission was in 2010. So this was a long time ago. Um, thinking that 2010 was already achieved almost 10 years ago. Um, but anyway, um, I, I couldn't, I probably didn't understand this as much then as I understand now in hindsight. Um, but you and, you know, earlier on the panel was about the role model, you know. Uh, I always think about that when I'm uh, having uh, a meal with my kids and there's a smartphone and you're like, do not touch it, <laughs> you know, because then when you wonder why your kids are going to ask when can they watch TV or play computer games, it's because you're also, you know, I'm not playing computer games or watching TV, but you know, if you're reading something educational, but anyway, so you have to really be that change. You cannot inspire anybody else if you're not inspired yourself. So I think that's really the, um, the first key message. And I think in, what, in ISEC, it's very interesting because everyone, almost everyone is a volunteer. How do you motivate people when you take away money? Which in, and I was at a business school at university where everything in theory is about money. And that I think is very, very important. Yeah, of course, Isaac was a non-profit and many of you work in non-profits. Now, you, hopefully you get paid something. Uh, in a non -profit, but you're not doing it for money. Probably, you're doing it for other reasons. And that's really important, even in a multinational company you cannot really pay people to do stuff. You know, it doesn't work that way. It would be almost internal corruption in a sense. So you have to also inspire people uh, in other forms. And I think I really learned that. And I said, how do you motivate people when you have to motivate them and find what matters to them? So that's the first key lesson. Um, oh, over here, that's up. Okay. Huh? Um, oh, here we are, yes. So the second one was um, about being proactive. Um, I, and these are not rocket science. I don't think anybody will say, oh, yeah, I don't want to be proactive. Um, but it's putting it into practice. I mean, sometimes you have to take risks. Uh, although I'm not, the reason I'm an entrepreneur, not an entrepreneur, is my risk threshold is probably quite low. <laughs> my wife is an entrepreneur. She can take risks. And of course, I've been, she's doing a PhD, so I'm well aware of all the theories of the whole risk taking and culture and attitudes and behaviors of entrepreneurship and so on. And that's not me. But I could be an entrepreneur rather than an entrepreneur. Um, and it's probably good if the family has got one of each. <laughs> Otherwise, the kids might not have much to go home to in the evenings. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, there's just, I just put up some pictures just out of make it a bit more interesting than looking at a picture of me or even my own face, um, which I really don't like looking at. It's like going to the PR world, I'm on TV. Actually, the, the voice is worse than the face, I have to say. <laughs> you listen to your own voice on TV or radio, it's horrible. <laughs> so that's a new thing I've had to learn, how to not listen to yourself, um, if you have to. But anyway, I get distracted. So, for example, when I was in ISEC, um, an alumni came up to me and said, look, there's this thing in China, if you care about China, you know, um, China's the future. This was way back before China was really the future. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and I said, okay, I don't know anything, but if you say so, sure. Uh, and we ended up organizing this big event in London. PwC sponsored it, hosted it. Uh, we had a very senior government minister come. Um, it was incredible because it's really old. Um, you're in Kenya, you know how this is. Um, the UK or maybe have got more younger politicians nowadays. And they feel like they're sleeping the whole time until it's their turn to speak. And then they just get like an energy bolt from nowhere. And then they finish and they sit down and fall asleep again. Um, so I've got that habit as well. Um, but anyway, so we organized this event, we made a profit, and didn't know what to do with the profit. 
And the alumni said, give it to the Chinese people. You know, help support ISIC in China. So we said, okay, why not? So anyway, we gave money to ISIC China. Oh, sorry, I went because the fucking accent. And then they said, why don't you come to China too? So I ended up moving to China just by accident because we ended up having this money um, and three flights. Um, but tell me, there it is, you cannot go anywhere for three months and get anything done. So my three months became years and years and years. Um, but anyway, the other thing was just doing whatever you feel like doing. When I was in ISEC China, whatever I was told to do wasn't working. I didn't speak the language, didn't know the culture, couldn't do anything actually what I was supposed to do. So I tried to do other things instead that were still useful. Uh, and that ended up working. And ended up generating money. Ended up paying for me to have a salary so I could stay longer than three months. Um, but you just have to do it. And uh, you just don't have to say no. You just have to kind of do whatever you want to do. And pick things that will help you in your career. So when I, you know, this was a, Isaac was an NGO in China at the time with five full-time staff paid like $200 a month um, because of that money that we raised earlier in London. Um, I was like, let's write an impact report. A small NGO, four people, full time, and like several hundred volunteers. No one had ever done that. We actually submitted it to the UN Global Compact or something as like the best practice of an NGO sustainability impact report. I think it's like the first ever NGO to do that. By me, like just left university, I had no idea what I was doing, read some stuff online and did this report. But you know, it wasn't that bad. And it was really good then for your career um, in the future because this became a whole big industry about writing sustainability reports and so on. Um, and let me uh, move on quickly. Um, the next lesson was really um, about how to influence people um, and how to be resourceful. And I think when I joined um, after ISEC, I ended up working at Plan International. Um, I ended up trying to help other people make their life easier. And I realized that's really important. You don't really think about what you want to achieve. Think about what the other person wants to achieve. Because if you cannot help them get what they need to get done, they're not going to want to do what you need to do. And actually, surprisingly, if you help them, things become really easy. Um, so uh, sometimes when I was at Plan, we were trying to fundraise. We had offices in rich countries that fundraise and gave the money to the poor countries, in which case China was one of them. And I just developed a big list of all the projects, lots of proposals, and they could then copy and paste and send to the donors in the rich countries. And we ended up with lots of money because no one else in the other 48 poor countries in the world were basically writing proposals that the rich countries could just copy and paste into their proposals. Because that's what they wanted. They didn't know what was happening in these 48 countries around the world. They didn't care who they got money for, China or Philippines or anywhere else. But they fundraised for China because they had all these ready-made materials that I had made. So it's very, very interesting. So you can be very, very resourceful. I didn't have a budget to do anything, but I managed to develop these materials that were really useful. I mean, fundraised lots and lots of money uh, for when I worked for Plan International in China. Then I ended up working at BSR, which is a real social enterprise, and somehow managed to raise several million dollars for this Tsuyen project. Um, and that was very interesting. I just wrote a proposal, you know, the first five pager that gets approved, then you get invited to write the long, page, the long one, and so on. In the end, we got all this money, and we used it to influence Chinese foundations. Now, back then, there was almost no Chinese foundations. There's this huge earthquake in 2008, the Chinese foundations became this huge, huge thing. People decided to give back and support their local communities. And we had to be there at the right time. And we had this program and we helped influence some of the biggest Chinese foundations to become more philanthropic and teach them how to do philanthropy. Um, the, the fourth one, I think, was about opportunism. I'm probably almost too opportunistic in that it distracts from doing what I'm supposed to be doing and what my boss expects me to do. But everything is about timing. Everything. And I think if when I've tried to do entrepreneurial stuff, even within my organizations, everything is timing. Normally for good reasons and for bad reasons. I decided to launch this big health project in Kenya, and then all the nurses, first the doctors went on strike, then the nurses went on strike, then there was an election, and then the, the governor decided to contest that election. And it took two and a half years before anything happened. This is in Lamont County, for those who want to go back. As a timing, I, didn't, I couldn't predict that. Okay, the election I knew was coming, but I didn't know there was going to be a year's worth of strikes before then. So that was really bad timing. But there can be really, really good timing as well. And you have to take advantage of circumstances. Um, this is um, a Samburu Girls Foundation. Um, a wonderful lady in the middle here. Um, she was one of the girls rescued from FGM in Samburu. Uh, I went up there a few years ago and was, spent half of my time crying and half my time happy because you really don't know when you go to these places. Like, it's incredible what these girls have been through and then how they're being helped. 
but how many others are still going through these things. So it's really emotional roller coaster. I would not recommend that, especially if you're a guy who's not used to crying <laughs> in public, <laughs> like me. Um, and the lady on the left, uh, who we donated all these computers to, is the founder. Um, she's fantastic. Um, so we managed to support them with loads of computers. We've got lots of momentum. Timing is also about momentum. Once you get some progress, you try and build on that. So we gave them computers. They set up this uh, like a reporting club. They started to promote themselves. Uh, then we managed to get them to come to Nairobi and give them a tour around Nairobi, we organized a big media thing. Uh, and then uh, all the employees were so excited in Huawei about what we were doing that these women in Samburu we managed to set up this thing, Women in Technology Huawei. I think it's the first in the whole world within Huawei globally, a Women in Technology group uh, to, within Huawei without Huawei. Um, so we have six pillars, it's a proper strategy, uh, not just PR, hopefully. Uh, that's the plan. <laughs> But you have to recognize how to sell things internally. And that means getting sometimes PR. PR drives companies to do stuff. Uh, most importantly, getting customers. So we do this together with Safaricom, with Telcom, with ICT Authority, all of our partners. The more I can involve our customers, the more I can justify this internally. Um, so set the internal sales skill, is put, and I'll end with this one, is the most important skill of entrepreneurship. Setting up, setting sideways, setting below, you know, setting all around the organization. I think everyone is a salesperson, whether you're, I started in an NGO, moved into social enterprise, was in consulting, was in the multinational. Um, so sell yourself sounds bad, but uh, <laughs> 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 uh, it, it is very, it is very important. And then um, uh, I used to, there was this, I learned a lot when I was at ISEC a long time ago, and I'll just wrap up with this. One of which was that we had lots of inspiring speakers. And no, I don't think universities have that on their agenda. You know, you learn knowledge, and knowledge is out something you can learn whenever you want. <coughs> you don't learn the inspiration, you don't learn the skills, you don't even learn the attitude that you need to be successful in life. Um, so the saying, you know, if not now, when? If not, ask who? I think it's very, very important. Uh, and that's still something I really think about. But I would almost summarize that to just, why not? Um, so I think that's my closing remarks. Thank you very much. <laughs>